welcome to this webinar, which is uh, part of our Review Meets Reviewed series at the Royal Anthropological Institute. Uh, we will have uh, with us today Professor Ian Hodder from Stanford University and Professor Julian Thomas from University of Manchester. And they will have a conversation about Professor Hodder's book, Where Are We Heading? The Evolution of Humans and Things, which was published by Yale University Press in 2018. And I'm going to hand over now to Julian Thomas, who's going to facilitate the conversation. Thank you very much for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm the reviewer. And at the risk of a cliche, it's my great pleasure to introduce a reviewed who really doesn't need any kind of introduction. Ian Hodder is the Dunleavy Family Professor of Anthropology at Stanford University, having previously been Professor of Archaeology at Cambridge. He's arguably the most influential archaeological theorist in the world, and since 1993 he's been directing massive excavations at the Neolithic site of Çatalhöyük in Turkey. Now his discoveries at that site were one of the contributing factors that led him to develop a theory of material engagement which is elaborated in the book that we're talking about today, Where Are We Heading? Now, although there has been a material turn in philosophy and human sciences in recent years, I think archaeologists have sometimes been slow to make their ideas about the material world accessible to a wider audience and to address the big questions that are facing humanity, such as the Anthropocene condition. And I think that's what makes Where Are We Heading such a unique work and I'm really looking forward to discussing it in the course of this evening. Now, as you've heard, the format of the event is going to be that Ian is first of all going to give uh, a presentation on the core arguments of the book before he and I explore those, those ideas together for a while. And then finally, uh, we'll open the session up to the audience uh, and hear what questions you've got. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian for his introductory remarks, Ian. Thank you very much, Julian, and um, thank you also to the RAI for uh, arranging this event, which I look forward to uh, very much. Th thank you to Julian for writing the review that sort of set it off, and uh, uh, thank you for the, to the RAA for the organisation and uh, the, the idea. Uh, so I, I should say at the, the start that, um, that, that, that where, where are we heading the book? was, as Julian says, an attempt to, become, to write something slightly more popular, something short and popular, to reach a broader audience. And I'm not sure that um, it's been terribly successful in, in, in that way. Um, some of the reviews, not, not Julian's reviews, but some of the reviews um, on Amazon were, were rather negative about the, the style of the, uh, of the book. Um, and... Um, and I, and, and it, I think it's relevant that I wrote the book under a different title. Uh, I was asked to write the book um, by Templeton and Yale uh, under the heading, why, why um, so is, is human evolution directional? Is human evolution directional? But when, when it came to the final publication, for some reason, uh, Yale um, particularly felt that that was not a good title, and so so we changed to where are we heading? And so there is a slight tension within the book between that question, where are we heading, and the book itself, which is not, which I didn't write the book around. So I, I um, there's a slight uncomfortability there, uh, concerned with the whole idea of making it popular. Anyway, let me let me um, go into the. Uh, the PowerPoint that I have uh, that I can so so I can explain some of the ideas in the in the book. We can see them. Ah, oh, yeah, good. You can. Okay, great. Oh, good. Um, so the book starts with. Um, something that I understand to be fairly obvious, um, which is that if you look at many parts of the world um, and maybe at the world overall, there has over time been an increase in the, the amount of stuff made by humans 
that that um, have become part of the social process. And there are, of course, many ways of trying to to measure the increase in our engagement with material things. Um, and uh, one of the things I do in the book is use some of the diagrams produced by Ian Morris, where he's looking at um, in developed societies in the East and, and in the West and measuring things like what he calls social development, which include things like how big cities are and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, an, another example uh, is of, of his work is here where he's looking at different parts of the world again, lo looking at the increases in um, what he calls energy capture, which is another way of saying how, how, how much um, resources one is extracting from the environment and making into things uh, and using proxies like the size of houses in order to look at the sort of gradual increase. Going, going back in some of his writing to 10, 11,000 BC and on and, and through up into the, into the present. So there, are, there have been many attempts to, to um, look at our increasing uh, impact on the environment and extraction of resources and, and the construction of uh, cultural works. Um, a, a, a very obvious thing to do as an archaeologist um, I, 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 is, is to look at just for spe specific examples. I, I work, as Julian says, that I uh, have been working at Chatelhuyuk, which is an early site in the, the Middle East about 9,000 years ago. And around that sort of period, people were harvesting using sickles, as you can see here, which are very, very simple flint or obsidian blades, which are stuck into a bone or an antler handle. Uh, so, and, and the contrast w w uh, in my daily life, digging these sorts of things up with the things, machines I see around me, uh, harvesting uh, cereals in the center of Turkey, these huge, enormous combine harvesters, which, which uh, combine a whole series of different functions uh, and, and actually move around fields without any driver. They sort of feel themselves around. And, and they're part of a massive chain of parts that are, so you can see the warehouses where there are 800,000 parts of, of um, these machines that are provided world, worldwide. So sort of a massive scale difference in scale. Um, another si simple example is, you now I dig up very simple things like these spindle worlds, um, which were part of, um, the sort of technology you see at the bottom left here. And through time from um, the, the Neolithic onwards, one gets this enormous change in spinning technologies, uh, so the spinning wheel. And then in the 18th and 19th centuries, the great expansion of, of spinning cotton and the whole, in, and whole cotton industry that, that um, uh, uh, one can document. Uh, another obvious example is, um, the car, uh, or rather the wheel, the sort of emergence of the wheel uh, around 6,000 years ago in, in different parts of uh, Europe and Asia, and, and then the gradual expansion of the function of the wheel in not, lots of different ways, le leading to sort of modern cars, uh, where there are often uh, 20, 30,000 different parts in the car that are all manufactured in different parts of the world and brought together uh, in, in, um, in a very, very, very complex system, which of course has an enormous effects on, on the environment. So, um, it, it, what, what I start with in the book is then this question of the, the increase in material stuff through time. And uh, then, um, and, and, uh, and I want to recognize, however, that not all parts of the world were equally involved in this, uh, this process. Uh, and we could perhaps talk about that later. Um, but um, as an overall process and in certain parts of the world, I think it's clear that this is, this is what has happened. Um, so how does one explain this? Uh, I mean, obviously, many people have tried to explain parts of it historically, particularly over recent centuries. But my concern had been with the overall process. And uh, one way of explaining that would be through various ideas of progress, um, which, would, which would suggest that there is some sort of inherent drive 
that humans have to accumulate um, or to complexify. And I find these uh, sorts of explanations difficult for a whole series of reasons, but mainly because they seem to be teleological. They seem to have the notion uh, right from the start that we know where we're heading. So a sort of inherent drive that pushes things forward. And I, I didn't, didn't like that as an explanation. So uh, an, an, another chapter then, then deals with another possible explanation that is somehow related to uh, biological evolution in, in some way or other. Uh, and um, in looking at the literature in the biological world, it became clear that while there was uh, clearly some notion that, um, uh, that a species uh, organisms adapt uh, to a particular environments, so that there is a, a local process of um, engagement with, uh, with environments that leads to a better and better fit with that local environment, there did not seem to be an overall, overall agreed uh, theory in bio, biological evolution that would explain the long-term overall process. So that there, there, is, there are theories for you know, greater fit or greater fitness in, in the local, at the local level, but not in the overall uh, directionality. Um, so, uh, so I, again, I felt, and, and there are various other critiques that I could make if people are interested of the biological evolutionary type of approach. So uh, having rejected those sorts of approaches um, as fully adequate, I, I um, focused on this, uh, this idea of entanglement. And th this is a, a, an idea that I developed in an earlier book called uh, Entangled. Uh, and um, the basic idea there is that humans over time have become increasingly entangled with things. And I, and I try to define this uh, in terms of a series of different types of dependency. So entanglement is uh, the sum of the human, of human dependence on things, HT, and thing dependence on thing, TT, and thing dependence on humans, and human dependence on humans. And clearly, the key idea here is about dependence. And so I argue that there are two aspects of dependent, dependence, a positive uh, and negative. Uh, the, on the one hand, dependence is about reliance. So you know, we rely on things uh, to cook food or to build houses and so on and so forth to get shelter. Uh, so we rely on things. Uh, and, and also uh, the, the idea of dependence has, has a notion of contingency in when you say something like it depends. So the, there's reliance and contingency on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is dependency uh, where one really means limitation and, and constraint. So for example, in many human relations, uh, there, are, there are relationships of, of people where, where um, they depend on each other, but are disruptive of each other at the same time. Or one could also talk about the colonial relationships which where there is a dependence but a, a holding back or a restraint or constraint on the colonized so um, dependency is something which involves limitation and, and constraint and over the over the years uh, since I first started thinking about entanglement I tried various various definitions uh, because I felt it, the, the problem with the definition that I've just given you is, is that it assumes rather a sort of straightforward separation of humans and things and so I, 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 I try to sort of uh, come up with other types of um, definition, uh, one which was the, dialect, the dialectic of dependence and dependency, the argument being that entanglement moves forward because of this dialectical relationship between the positive and the negative, that everything has positives and everything has negatives, and these contradictions and conflicts move things forward as people try to resolve them. And then more recently, I, I've tried to define entanglement as a metaphor that tries to capture the contradictory messiness of the heterogeneous flows and counterflows that produce and chain and encompass entities, where, where entities include humans, animals, things, ideas, and social institutions. And that definition is obviously very influenced by recent debates in the new materialism. So as Julian uh, mentioned, 
um, these ideas about entanglement largely came about through my excavation of Chattel Huyuk, which is a 9,000 year old mound uh, settlement site in central uh, Turkey. And uh, I became fascinated there by the, the, the very, very complex webs of interdependence between humans and things and tried to start drawing them out in these sorts of intentionally messy and complicated um, diagrams. Um, the different types of arrows here refer to different types of uh, dependency. And I, and I just want to give you an example of um, what's going on in these diagrams. So here we have dogs and midden. So mid by midden, I mean refuse areas. So uh, one can say that dogs depend on middens because we know that dogs were kept in the midden areas. They were not allowed into houses. Um, so that dogs depend on, on middens in that sense, but middens also depend on dogs in the sense that middens uh, were lived in by the dogs and were cleaned up by, by the dogs eating refuse and so on. Um, but so that's a codependence, co but it's a negative relationship in the sense that um, dogs also contribute to the problems of middens. So we find their defecations uh, in the middens. So they're adding to the problem and the smell and so on of, of middens as well as cleaning them up. And so there's this sort of contradictory com uh, type of codependence that's going on there. And throughout the diagram, there are these types of uh, uh, relationships. Another very important aspect of entanglement is that these relationships all have a temporality to them. So it, the, the different parts are connected through time. There are pathways. So this has to happen before that has to happen before that has to happen. So for example, we get fuel to, to, to um, uh, put into the fire to cook food uh, that, and, that, and was that therefore produces residues that go onto the middens. So there are these, these um, sequences. And in, in a way, the whole entanglement is a whole series of uh, intersecting pathways that have to wait for each other. So it's a very, it's very complex and messy and contingent, everything depending on each other, but also waiting for each other uh, um, in, in complex meshworks. Uh, another sort of key idea in entanglement is the idea of entrapment, uh, which is as the, the notion that humans get caught in a double bind. On the one hand, uh, they're constrained by the fact that they depend on things, but they also uh, have to look after the things that they're, um, they're depending on. And perhaps one of the clearest examples of this is the domestication of plants and animals. And this diagram, is one produced by Dorian Fuller, where he's trying to make the point that when you're harvesting wild, sorry, when you're harvesting wild um, uh, plants, uh, you have a certain process of, de of um, harvesting and dehusking and winnowing and so on. You have a certain process that goes on here. But once you, once you domesticate plants, that the plants annoyingly change, or, or rather not annoyingly, but there are there are positive aspects of the fact that they change so that they have a tough rachis, which means that the heads uh, don't come, up, come off the, the plant uh, in, unless you really work at it by threshing, by threshing and winnowing. And so by becoming, by domesticating plants, one gets drawn into uh, harder work. And, and so you're not only dependent on plants, but you, you, you have to sort of do things to make, make sure that that dependence uh, can continue. And so you get entrapped over the long term in, in harder work, which you know, ultimately leads to the construction of machines and so on and so forth. Um, and so this, this idea of a double bind or entrapment is a very key idea and very cl clearly related to another idea of path dependence, which is the idea that um, which is not one of my ideas, but it's, it's, one, it's an idea that is, is um, uh, found in a number of disciplines, which argues that once one sets off down a particular pathway, it becomes very difficult to move, to go back. Um, one gets sort of stuck down a particular pathway. 
And um, what the one example uh, that I use is again at Chatelhuyu, where pottery is introduced um, towards the beginning of the sequence, but then there's a lot of change through time. And as the pottery changes, so the entanglements uh, increase. So it's as if pottery has a set of affordances or potentials that are only um, realized uh, th gradually through time. And I think this is often, often the case with innovations that one, one starts off with, with an idea and a, and a thing that um, one gradually realizes all these sort of implications and uh, potentials. And so in the, in the earliest phases down, down here, um, pottery is just used very simply as a container and the fabric and the pots are not, not usable for cooking. But at, through time, um, cooking pottery emerges uh, and that is used for a whole series of um, processing of fats and meats and, uh, and milk products and, and so on. So the entanglements of the, entanglements of the pottery uh, increase and then th further through time pottery becomes decorated and it becomes used for storage and so with the decorated and the storage functions again the, the entanglements increase uh, but one but at, at this early point it would have been one imagines possible uh, to to say oh okay, well let's give up on pottery as, as some societies do let's give up on pottery we, we can go back, we don't want to go down this pathway. But as you move on and more and more gets entangled with pottery, it becomes very, very difficult to see how uh, you, you can move back. So, so much has been invested in pottery and it becomes such a, a part of many different parts of life that it becomes very difficult to see how you would go backwards. And so you get sort of stuck going down, rather like with agriculture, you get stuck going down a particular sort of uh, route. But as you go down this route, um, you get messy contingent contradictions and conflicts emerging. There's no reason why these entanglements as you go through time should be coherent in any way. It's not, not a coherent system. It's a messy set of in conjunctive relationships. And um, so for example, uh, we, we have evidence that people were extracting clays to make pottery from around the site. And we know that this added to the wetness uh, and environmental degradation immediately around the site, which then had an impact on the use of the local area around the site to plant uh, and, and to, to plant and harvest cereals and to look and to graze sheep. And so a contradiction emerged between these two things that then had to be resolved. And I, I would argue generally that, and there are other examples that I won't go into here, but that. Um, that, that, that generally, as, as these uh, entanglements expand over time, it, uh, that you're going to get contingent contradictions and conflicts that, that emerge, that then have to be resolved, which then leads to further entanglement. Well, more recently, I've been doing other work, which I guess the example of talking about entanglement is, is that it allows you to produce really messy diagrams. Uh, that, that looked just hopelessly, hopelessly complicated. But what I'm trying to do here is to show uh, that the whole series of different types of sequences or processes uh, through the occupation at Chatelhuyu, so through time from about 7,000 BC to about 6,000 BC, that through these this thousand years, uh, more and more things got entangled with each other, producing conflicts and, uh, and, and contradictions. And, one way of talking about that is to sort of pick, up, pick it apart and look at particular parts of it. And here I'm just suggesting that if we looked at cooking um, as, a, as a process, what we see through time is that a whole series of, um, of processes like living in the house and building houses and cooking and use of baskets and so on come together, are brought together uh, through a set of contingent factors uh, in the middle of the sequence, uh, uh, which, which then leads uh, to the, the need to, to resolve those problems uh, by, uh, by using pottery for cooking rather than the previous function for cooking, which had been to cook with clay balls. And so the, the argument here is, 
in more generally that you have these different pathways, as I showed earlier, that come into conflict or friction with each other, which have consequences that both produce transformation of um, those pathways and the emergence, the, the sort of, and emergent properties like new technologies such as um, pottery for cooking. And uh, in the book, I also I, I use some more contemporary examples, going back to the cotton uh, case or, or spinning leading to spinning cotton. And um, I try, try to sort of, in these sorts of diagrams, obviously very, very inadequately, uh, but just to sort of gesture to the way in which um, that sequence of increasing engagement with um, co cotton spinning man manufacturing is linked to a huge a range of other factors um, that, that all play contradictory and complex roles. And for example, um, one of the problems that emerged in the uh, later 18th century were, was that um, cotton could be produced with cheap labor in uh, India that undercut the production of cotton, which is largely done in the home in, in Britain. And so people who wanted to invest in cotton uh, in order to compete with the, um, the low price cotton coming in from India, uh, in, in innovated by developing uh, the, the water frame and then gradually other, other types of mechanical um, cotton, cotton spinning uh, that, that then led to the production of factories and the movement of workers from domestic context into factories and, and all the other things that are associated with, with the Industrial Revolution. So that, that's just a small part of this very sort of complex set of interactions that's going on where you get conflicts and contradictions emerging that are dealt with and resolved by increasing technology uh, in certain directions. So that what, in general terms, this is a, one of the diagrams in the book that you have this sort of sense of um, uh, a cumulative cone of affordances that develops through time whether the cones of entanglement uh, around them um, that also expand as the affordances are, are recognized. But there are endless conjunctions or conflicts and contradictions uh, that emerge between the, the, these different components, uh, pushing the whole thing uh, forward. So I just want to to finish really by um, giving an example which is not in the book, um, but which I, I might bring, bring the, the situation um, uh, home more clearly, which is the general increase in um, our use of digital technologies and, and particularly the role of social uh, media. And at one level, um, one of the most obvious points here uh, is that um, while we tend to think and, and separate off our iPhones or our smartphones from the energy that produces them, um, that there, of course, is in fact a massive uh, use of energy uh, that is sort of behind the scenes in these hidden um, servers of, of a massive scale. So we tend to talk about digital technologies as if they're very light or airy. So we have words like the air book or the cloud or the web, these sort of light things. But as Mark Mills and others have argued, the cloud begins with coal, at least in those parts of the world where, the major, where electricity is largely still produced through coal. So the digital age contributes in that way to global warming and to our in overall sort of impact uh, on the environment, but the, but so, but social media through digital technology is also very negative uh, and has all sorts of contradictions uh, in other ways. Um, and uh, I am using here a, a film that many of you may have seen called The Social Di Dilemma, which is a Netflix documentary in two thousand and twenty. Um, and 
uh, as they say in the in the film, the, 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 these new social digital technologies are simultaneously utopian and dystopian. So that, that fits in very much with what I'm trying to argue, that, that everything has its uh, positive and negative uh, sides. Uh, and uh, in dealing with the negative sides, we, we get trapped for, into further um, engagement. Uh, also in the film, they say that the technology that connects us, so this is a good example of these contradictions, the technology that connects us also polarizes us, divides us, controls us, distracts us, monetizes us, manipulates us. And it's not really the phone itself that's the problem, but all the entanglements of the phone, especially a business model in which revenue comes from advertising and selling personal information to advertisers who use complex AI and psychology to increase market share who aim to manipulate people's likes and dislikes for commercial gain. And this creates an irreversible entrapment, at least that's how it's seen by the people involved. So one of the people in the film says, you can't in practice put the genie back in the bottle. You can make some tweaks, but, the end of, but at the end of the day, you've got to grow revenue and usage quarter over quarter. The bigger it gets, the harder it is for anyone to change. What I see is a bunch of people who are trapped by a business model, an economic incentive and shareholder pressure that makes it almost impossible to do something else. And of course, one could say very much the same about the car and the way the car and various other technologies that we have developed um, are leading to enormous impact on the environment. And many of the solutions to how we deal with this environmental crisis involve yet further technological intervention. And this is sort of a cartoon that sort of makes fun of the idea that we deal with um, global warming by pumping um, sulfur into the upper atmosphere which is one of the solutions that geoengineers are, are suggesting. So this is, if you like, the nightmare that results from um, uh, the processes that I've been talking about. Uh, and, I, and I hope that in some way or other, this discussion of entanglement contributes uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to our understanding of, of this process. Um, it's clearly very, very difficult I found it difficult writing what was supposed to be a popular book uh, because one gets drawn into making very general statements at a very um, superficial level. Um, but nevertheless, I, I, I felt and still feel that it's important to try and make the points that I'm, that I'm making here. So that's, that's all I have to say as an introduction, Julian. Thank you so much, Ian, for that very clear introduction. Um, I wonder whether I could start by taking you back to the 1980s and to a time when you were defining a symbolic and structural and contextual archaeology. And one of the very important things that you said back there was that material culture is not passive but active. And I wonder whether there's a direct strand of continuity that leads from where you were then to where you are now. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's right. I, I, um, I, I always felt um, that in the early ages, the early time of, of what became known as post-processual archaeology, uh, and, and what I described as a contextual approach, um, that for me, the, and it still remains, I think, the most important aspect about trying to understand material culture, is that it has an active role to play in society, that it's not just a passive reflection of what we do, but it actively engages. Uh, but, but I think there has been a shift in emphasis in that or originally uh, I was mainly concerned with the way we use material culture actively. So we use material culture um, to um, argue against or to compete against or to point out issues or to uh, create senses of identity, um, create senses of belonging, um, and so on. So there are a whole ra ra range of ways in which we use material culture actively in order to tra transform the world. And I think over time, while I still think 
you know, feel, believe in that very strongly. I, I've become more interested in a way in which material culture itself is active. That, that it, that it, um, so at Chattelhuyuk, people had a terrible time, you know, keeping their, wall, their houses up. The, 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 the walls kept collapsing. And so we find all these collapsed walls all over the place. And uh, that's because they were using a type of clay, a smectitic clay, which expands and contracts very radically um, in, um, when, when it gets wet and dries. And, and so they were struggling all the time with uh, that active aspect of material culture. And, and one can see a lot of their interventions uh, as being about dealing with that, that, that issue. And, and of course, that whole question of material culture as active and agentive um, has you know, now links into a much broader debate about you know, actin networks and actins and so on and so forth. That I think connects up very much with um, a whole series of arguments about where we are now and about the Anthropocene. And particularly the way that non-human entities in your work are, are seen as extending and amplifying uh, what may be the unintended consequences of our actions. So I wonder whether there is there are similarities with what you are saying in this book with some of the arguments that Anna Singh have been making recently, again about the Anthropocene, um, the way in, in which uh, the, the Anthropocene is more than human. And that uh, perhaps when we use that term, the Anthropocene, we're, we're mistakenly imagining it to be something that is uh, human-centered to, to a, a great extent. Yes, I mean, I, I have lots of problems with the Anthropocene, um, largely because it seems to assume some point, some point in which we, um, we're, we're not you know, affecting the environment. And, um, uh, and, and I think the evidence is that, you know, way back into the Paleolithic, but you know, very, very early on, we were having impacts on, on the environment. But um, I, I, it, it, I'm afraid, I, I, I mean, I know Anna Singh's work on mushrooms and so on, but, but, I, but I'm not sure I, I uh, know the example of what you're referring to. But, but, but certainly I... Um, so certainly, there seems to be a way. Well, hmm. maybe you could rephrase your question, Julian, so that I don't no, go off I, at some I, strange I, angle. I was really just pointing out to the way that she's been talking about the um, the Anthropocene as something that is more than simply the effects of humanity, because everything that we do gets bound into a whole series of connections with non-human entities of various kinds. And those outcomes keep escaping us and keep coming back and biting us in ways that, that we don't expect. So the, perhaps much of the discussion on the Anthropocene has been a bit anthropocentric. And she's trying to say, well, actually, it's, it's far more than this. I don't know. I'd have to think about that, Julian. I'm, I'm not sure that um, I, I, I'm worried about a general a uh, uh, trend within sort of the new materialisms uh, towards flattening and uh, decentering the human. And, and I'm not sure that I want to um, uh, go down that road. I mean, I know that I don't want to go down that road. I, I think it's important that, I think it's important that we, we recognize the human centeredness of the Anthropocene uh, in the sense that we, you know, we, we are the ones that are affecting the environment and it's a very one-sided process. Uh, in my view, but 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 on the other hand, I absolutely agree that um, that I mean I, I you you remember people like Anthony Giddens that we were all very excited by in the eighties, and in a way I feel you know he was about structure and, and structuration, structure and agency and all that sort of stuff. And then there were the unintended consequences, and I, and I feel that what I'm really doing is just saying that we we need to theorize the unintended consequences. And, um, and, and that those, those are the things that are the, 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 the tail that's really wagging the dog. And um, so I, I absolutely accept that, what, 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 that we get caught up in these enormously complex entanglements that, um, 
that we, we lose control of. And, uh, and, and because of our various vested interests and so on, can't resolve. And so it, it, it is the case that this, the larger thing out there has, has become bigger than us. And, and it's difficult, well, I don't want to say impossible to resolve, but, I, but, it, but one, one's very close to saying it's impossible to resolve. Yeah, that brings me to, to one of the things that I raised in the review, which is, is there a sense in which we can ever become unentangled? And is it, on the one hand, there's a sense that we have always been bound up with things, that there's never been a, a prelapsarian state where we are free, totally. But does that mean that it is impossible to reel back and find ourselves in a position where a bit where we are a bit freer of things than we are now. Yes, there are, there are a number of ways of uh, talking about that. I, I think Julian. Um, one is to say that I, you know, of course, humans have always been um, entangled with things if by things you're including the natural world. I mean, I mean, as Dar Darwin talked about, um, you know, the, ta the, the tangled bank, you know, all, all, all species are tangled up with each other and tang entangled with the world. Um, but I, but I, I would insist that while that's true, that over time, the nature of the entanglement has changed because of this notion of the double bind. The one, once, once humans start making things, and as they, and, and particularly as they make certain types of things, uh, they they get drawn into this double bind. Um, you know, so some some something like the you know an animal like the beaver is clearly entangled with the bank that that, that they make and with the. You know, with the environment that they construct by building dams and so on. But the beaver, the beaver only gets entangled to a certain degree. Humans uh, go much farther down the flows of entanglement and, and try to resolve issues at a much more complex level. And so uh, they, they get, um, uh, in my view, there's a difference of scale uh, that, that becomes extremely important. So one, one so I, I would insist on the one hand that uh, I certainly we've always been entangled, but not in the proper sense that I would argue. I think the sort of double bind entrapment path dependency thing is something which is um, peculiar to once we make things and change things so that they become dependent on us, then something else happens, I would, I would argue. So that's one way of answering or thinking about your question. Another is to say, is it possible nowadays to become um, uh, less entangled? And of course, there are huge numbers of movements out there of people trying to do just that. You know, lots and lots of environmentally um, conscious people doing responsible things, uh, shopping in a particular type of way. Uh, being minimalist in, in the, the way of life, becoming more ascetic or spiritual. And, you know, there are lots and lots of ways in which people uh, are trying to become disentangled nowadays. Whether, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm very supportive of that and, and I would hope to contribute to it. Um, but clearly there are lots of problems about you know, is it only certain types of people who can afford to do that sort of thing? You know, what, what, you, do you have to have a certain positionality before you can disentangle and so on and so forth? So I, I, I think there are lots of issues to talk about. Um, and, you know, wh whether, whether it has a long-term impact is another, is another matter. I think that's really interesting that there's a kind of a paradox that you're identifying that the beavers once things get so bad, they just forget about it and leave the dam. It's almost because we care and have concern and wish to preserve things and conserve them that we keep putting more and more effort into that process of conservation. So it, it's, it's, a, 
in some ways, because we're so bothered about things, that the things entrap us and make us care for them even more. Yeah, but why do we care about them? Mm. I, I would argue we care about them because we're entangled with them. You know, um, I mean, beavers do make a great effort to, to, um, to, to fix the dam and they, uh, they only give up when things get really bad. In, 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 um, in the case of the Aswan Dam that I, that I talk about, um, we, we didn't need to, to, you know, we didn't need to lift those um, monuments up to higher ground. We could have just let them you know, disappear. We don't need to save heritage. Why do we care about heritage? And, and I would argue it's not because we have some fundamental care, you know, towards heritage, but that you know, her the heritage has become something that we we're entangled with. And there's a sort of global movement to care about those things because it's in people's interest to care about it. You know, there are institutions and, you know, UNESCO grew up around the Aswan Dam and so on and so forth. So there's an institutional concern and people realize that there's an opportunity here to, to do something. Um, you know, we industrialization creates the fact that we're destroying things and, and then we care about them uh, because we, we develop a concern. It's not from some underlying notion of care, but because in a particular context, it's become something that we care about. You see what I mean? Mm. But that can lead you in two directions. One is to say, well, let's stop the industrialization and let's stop the, the harm that's being done to the world. But you could also say, well, let's just let things be. Let's let them pass away. Perhaps we yes. shouldn't care about them. Kind of yes. Way. Well, I absolutely. <laughs> I'm afraid I, I'm of the view. I'm, I'm afraid I'm of the view that, um, you know, in certain contexts that that might be the right thing to do, but, but clearly not in other contexts. There are there are many contexts in which I would fight strongly for people to be able to um, um, assert their identity and their rights through heritage and, and uh, um, yeah, so it depends. That's what I'm saying. It's not. There's not some sort of overall. overall you know, we don't have to care about heritage, but 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 it, but but it, we, we do, and quite rightly do in in many contexts. Mm. Uh, you, you said at the very beginning that you started out by writing a book about evolution and perhaps about both social evolution and biological evolution, and. Uh, with social evolution in particular, you're very critical of the teleology, uh, the stadial character of systems of, of um, social evolution, and the sense that they're, they're bound up with the idea of progress. And one of the authors that you don't mention is Thomas Malthus. And I wonder whether there are some similarities between Malthus talking about the way that human ingenuity keeps coming up with new ways to allow people to have a better life but all they do is create more population uh, and so that human misery just gets worse and worse and worse uh, and this is meant as a, a kind of counterblast against the enlightenment i wonder whether there are commonalities between your arguments and what malthus is saying yeah absolutely yes absolutely that's right i i am um... And, and Steve Shannon has pointed that out in a in a debate. That this is very sorry in, a, in another review. <laughs> that, 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 that this is that the argument is Malthusian rather than Bozeropian, if you like. Yeah. Um, coming on to what you're saying about cereals and blades in the Neolithic and opium and heroin in more recent times, um, you're talking about the way in which connections ramify. And I wonder whether there's a spatial element to that, and there's, there's more to be said, said about the spatiality of a theory of entrapment. Yes, absolutely. I, I um, although I would guess, um, I guess I would 
you know, prefer to try and start talking about space time rather than spatiality versus mm -hmm. temporality. I mean, I think, I think entanglement, as I also said, is very much about um, temporality. Um, and, um, and, but it's true that I've tended to focus on the temporal rather than on the spatial. And I think that's a uh, failing, particularly in relation to this question of why there are some parts of the world that um, have gone down this route more readily than others have done. Um, and whether there is something we can learn from those parts of the world where uh, they have not gone down this route so, so readily. But um, certainly a lot of the drive towards um, greater entanglement results from the colonial process and the, the incorporation of other parts of the world in, into the one. And, um, and that really in the whole notion of entanglement, as, as many writers have, have argued, um, need, need, needs to focus very much on that colonial imperial um, exploitative uh, process. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't know whether that's what you you meant, but but I do think that um, the, the documenting that um, gradual expansion of connectivity is, is something that I, I haven't really focused on, and, and we're, we're, yeah. Taking that argument or those points about evolution a bit further, um, it's clear that one of the things that social evolution and biological evolution have in common is that they're, they're very much generalizing approaches. Is it the contingency of processes of entanglement that really is the thing that makes your version of evolution different from either of those uh, different forms of, of evolutionary process? I would hope so, yes. I mean, I, um, the contingency and the messiness of it, I mean, the non-systematic nature of it. Um, yes, I, 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 and going back to that idea of unintended consequences that, that you know, there are contingent things that happen. Um, I mean, obviously I'm trying to, tr trying to sort of uh, walk a fine line between arguing that everything is contingent and unintended and out of one's control uh, and um, ha having some sense of directionality. I I'm trying to have directionality without teleology. And that's obviously very yeah, hard. And, and, it's obviously very hard yeah. and it's a very fine line. And, and other people have pointed out to that, that contradiction, but I still insist that there is a distinction between the notion that there is a drive in some direction and, and the notion that um, just because we depend on things, everything else follows. You know, that it's our de because we depend on things that we then get drawn, drawn into everything. And, and, and um, th th so that, that's the only universal claim I'm making is that humans depend on things. Sure, and, and that means that things entrap us more and more and that there is a direction that we go into but but can you imagine uh, a, a history of the world in which things have turned out very differently despite our degree of involvement with things and we're not we're not looking at a situation where we've got cop 26 opening on, on sunday and we're, we're worried about the climate collapsing could it have gone a different way Yes, I, well, I, I think that we could have, you know, Australian Aboriginal cut societies, example, you know, uh, South, mm. South American Amazon, Amazonian societies. Uh, I think, I think, you know, there, there are alternatives. Um, yeah, I think there are alternatives. I, I my, my sense is that, um, that even and so I do talk a little bit about the Australian sequence, and I'd love for if anybody wants to come in on this, because I don't know a huge amount about it, but 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 it does does seem to me that I mean people do argue that there is some gradual increase in entanglement in the in the pre-pre-colonial Australian 
context, but but of a very much you know much slower and different type of nature, and um, and and of course the sort of uh, the the um, entanglements are heterogeneous and they involve ideas. They include ideas and the ideas of the way that we can interact about how we should interact with the world can can play a, a major role and uh, I, I would hope there is some hope for us in, in that idea. Mm, I'm aware that time is going on so I'm going to stop asking questions soon and uh, let someone else have a go but I want to, to end up by talking about inconspicuousness um, which I think is one of the very interesting elements of, of what you're saying because you're saying it's in the nature of people to be dependent on things. It's in the nature of things for their connections to become invisible, to become inconspicuous, so that when we see things as objects, they, they appear standing isolated. Whereas when they disappear into the background and do their work, um, they become more thing-like rather than object-like. So is it is it the inconspicuousness of things or the inconspicuousness of the connections between things that uh, is the source of their stickiness and their entrapment? Yes, I think that's, I, I mean, I'm sure that's right. And um, I, I've written about that. I think it's really a fascinating aspect that we, we focus on. And, and it's very difficult not to do, you know, I, I, I've got my bio here. And I have no idea where this was made or, or who made it or what the different components, parts of it are and so on and so forth. And it's very difficult to have that knowledge. I mean, I, I, I've tried sort of shopping for clothes uh, in a way that would allow me to make sort of informed decisions. But, you know, the, the very rarely is there very much information about, you know, where something and who and who made things and so on. So we, we're entirely cut off from all the entanglements of things. and. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at the entanglements of producing a car, the global entanglements, it's absolutely mind boggling, you know, bits and pieces put together in Japan and then sh shifted to China, and shifted to parts of Africa, you know, and they will get put together in somewhere in Belgium or something, whatever. I mean, it, it's, it's mind boggling. And we, we just don't see, we don't see all that. We also don't see the, the temporality of it. We don't, we don't see that this, uh, has a this has a history that goes through time that, that it's just a, a moment in a flow through time so we, we we sort of separate things off from their space time entanglements and that that of course it, it it's in people's interest to do that it's in people's interest not to draw attention to the, the, the chains of, of production uh, and um, and to avert our attention from them. So, yeah, I think, yeah sorry. I, go on. Well, I, I, was, I was interested in what you were saying about the temporality of things, because one of the things you're emphasizing a lot is the instability of, of things so that they keep needing fixing and that draws us into their care and, and draws us into involvement with them. But I think one of the other things about the temporality of things that, is that they're very often durable and that they outlive us and they set the conditions for what's going to happen after us. And that means on the one hand that they, they can be a stabilizing if, um, influence on human societies, but they can also be an enduring danger to human society. So we have you know, nuclear power stations that are shucking out waste and then we have to think of ways of dealing with that waste and making sure that that waste is safe for future generations. So I wonder whether the durability of things is another aspect of their, their, their entangling quality. Yes, absolutely. And that so that, that for me, that relates back to the point I was making about those messy diagrams it is that, that there's lots of history in them and, and uh, lots of um, build, build up of uh, residues, if you like, um, that uh, we, I mean, uh, an, another example um, 
is, is that you know we, we're all very excited about solar, solar panels and we think you know great this is a, but we, we don't think about the fact that actually there are lots of components of so, so solar panels that are rather difficult to to discard and get rid of with, without um, without harming the environment. And so so it, over and over again, we don't think about that. You know what you were talking about—the sort of longer term, the, the longer term durability of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is another aspect of of the whole new technology thing that that you were mentioning that mobile phones are full of lithium and that's got all kinds of yes, yeah. and so on. Um, I should stop asking questions and uh, turn to some of the ones which have been put into the chat by our audience. Uh, the first one is from uh, Lara. It says the idea of entanglement can be applied to political turmoil, for instance, corruption in many governments, as if there's no way out but a revolution. Can points of entanglement or point of entrapment on no return be identified in past events or even predicted? Or are we doomed to just witness things as they unravel? Yeah, that's a really interesting um, question. I am. I, um... I mean, clearly, clearly there are lots of unintended consequences. I, you know, I, I, I think like with many people, I was initially very um, impressed by the whole idea of social media. And I thought, and I thought this is really great. And I, I focused on all the positives that come from Facebook and so on and so forth. And it's only really, through time that I've come to see them as so, so very, very uh, negative. Um, could, I, could one have seen that in, in advance? I, prob probably one could, um, but, but I think what one's so invested in these new things and so excited by them that they, that tends to sort of take over. Um, I, I guess one, one knows that there's a problem with nuclear waste so it seems to me more, it's, so it's not so much that we don't know that these things are going to happen, it's that we're not really in, we don't have the um, motivation, um, the economic or other types of motivation to do anything about it. It's, it seems, you know, our, we, we want vested interests, want Facebook to expand, they want nuclear energy to expand. Um, and it seems like the right thing to do to some people. Uh, um, and so it's not, it's not that we can't see what's coming, it's that we don't want to see what's coming, if you like. Yeah, that's a, a good argument for the value of science fiction, isn't it? That it's a really good idea for people to be thinking through some of the implications of yeah, new technologies right. as they are emerging. Yes, that's right. And, and that, that may also, of course, Julian, you could say it's science fiction, but it's also one of the roles of archaeology, in my view, is to is to show that um, you know, people have faced similar things in the past and, and how, how did they face them? Yes. Yeah, and it's, there certainly are things that repeat themselves and, and problems that are similar, but I wonder whether it's in the nature of the, the gathering of complexities that you're talking about that there are challenges that emerge that simply are unlike ones that we faced before. Yes, no, I think that's true. I mean, I, I, I what, what, on the one hand, I, um, so, so again, vested interest, you know, on the one hand, I support people who are trying to argue that at Chattel who you, one can, one can see how people responded to environments and that's useful to the present. But on the other hand, it's clearly very much a stretch. I mean, the sort of nature of Chattel Huyuk society is so, so different from the things we face today. But I'm not sure that the lessons are really very learnable. Yeah, and uh, that, that brings me to, a, to another question that I was going to ask, which is, we're talking about an evolutionary process by which entanglement and entrapment increases. Overall, do you see that as a sort of smooth, gradual increase or is it a punctured 
equilibrium? Are there, are there particular horizons at which the, the degree of entanglement suddenly increases? Yeah, that, that's again something that's come up in some of the um, comments and reviews of the book. I, and I, I'm in two minds about it. And I, for me, it's in, in a way a sort of, um, it, it's a factual question that we, we could try and resolve. But uh, on, on the one hand, it clearly is the case that there are you know, moments of great sudden punctuated change, you know, like the late 18th century or um, uh, the Roman era or, or whatever. I mean, the, 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 there are these moments what of sudden, or <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you and I might see that, Julian, but I'm not sure that anyway. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so on the one hand, I think there are these moments and increases and declines, sort of booms and busts, absolutely. Uh, and some of Ian Morris's diagrams uh, show that. But um, on, the, on the other hand, I, I'm, I'm much more attracted to the idea that behind the scenes, there is this sort of gradual everydayness change, you know, the everyday small little changes that are sort of churning along and, and that these, these sort of burst out in, uh, in, into sort of sudden rapid change, you know, like the sort of uh, the collapse of the, you know, in our lifetimes, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union is an example of one of these sure. sort of su sudden events. It was amazing. I mean, why, why did that all happen in a couple of years? And, um, but, it, but it, you know, there was a lot of stuff. That, it wasn't just like that. I mean, there were lots of things going on for a long, long time that, that um, underpinned that. So, so I, I have, I'm two minds about the punctuated thing. Hmm. Right, there's a question here from an anonymous FND. He says, what occurs and how can we conceptualize what occurs when a society is unable or unwilling to solve those inherent contradictions you mentioned as the cone of affordance and uh, consequences? Um, what would appear as systemic collapses, for instance, the Bronze Age, or Mayan collapses, or are there no collapses, only different entanglements? Yes, I'm afraid I take that view that there are no collapses, there are just different forms of entanglement. I mean, I, I think it's very difficult to argue that Mayan society collapsed. I mean, it changed, but you know, Mayan society continued and um, is very vibrant. So, so I, I, um, I, I, There are clearly moments when um, there are clearly moments of radical change, uh, where the centrality of certain uh, societies alters. Um, you know, so in my lifetime, you know, I was born in an era where um, there was still some vestiges of the British Empire hanging on and through my life, you know, it's been the story of the, of, of Britain trying to come to terms with, um, with its loss of its global presence. But that, that I wouldn't argue that Britain has become less entangled, it's become differently, differently entangled and, per and perhaps even more entangled, more entrapped in certain, you know, I, I think the, the question of who is more, I mean, I think we, we haven't talked about degrees of entanglement, these degrees of entrapment. And I think it's very important to say that um, some people are more entangled than others or more entrapped than others. Uh, and uh, that, you know, I, I have written about the poverty trap as an example of, of entanglement and that it's much more difficult for people at the lower end of the, of the income scale um, to, to disentangle than it is for people at the upper end. And uh, people get really trapped in poverty. Uh, because of the sort of way that um, economic um, deprivation is linked to educational deprivation and health deprivation and, and, and so on and so forth. There are all these entanglements. It's all those entanglements that make it impossible, really, for people to, to um, go up the social ladder. Um, you know, people are very trapped at the bottom level. So I, I think that's true, you know, globally as well. And I think it's, uh, you know, that, that inequality that's, that's within entanglements, I think, is a very important part of the story. 
Yeah, that point about collapse is very interesting because you know, is, is entanglement a one-way street or, or is there a fluctuation? Do, does the degree to which people entangle sometimes decline or is it all heading in the one direction? And is that notion of collapse, and you know, there's an awful lot of dystopian fiction about what happens after society collapses, is that a kind of a wish fulfillment where people are imagining that you can uh, have a free and individual life if society would collapse and go away. Yes, that's right. So you, you're arguing that the idea of disentanglement is, is an argument of the far right, uh, so li li liberalism. Uh, kind of, kind of. Yeah. It can be. I, I think many of these ideas, you can put them into a right wing or to a left wing context. Yes. Yeah. Inherently one way or the other. Yeah. I, I am. Um... I, I, I do think that, uh, that, that there are very powerful movements towards uh, uh, disentangling um, and that, you know, we, we, we're attracted to those ideas for a whole series of different types of reasons. I think you're right that there are people on the right and people on the left who are equally moved by the idea of, di of disentangling. I think that's right. Um, yeah. There's another question now, which I think um, bears very much on what we've just been talking about from Kia Riccio, who says, thank you so much for your talk. Some of the diagrams suggest a sort of bottleneck, which is then addressed through technology, e.g. economic standardizing cotton production. What are some other causes of bottlenecking or standardization across systems? Well, what are some of the other examples of of bottlenecks. Of bottlenecking or standardization across systems. Um, so yes, the, the, the example that's being referred to is the standardization of, of cotton production. Um, I think that's what's being said here. Yeah, so there's a, yes, there's a bottleneck at a certain point, which is then addressed by new technology. And I think what the questioner is asking is, are there, are there other examples you can think of in which uh, what appears to be a bottleneck has been um, overcome through some form of technology? Yeah, well, I, I would argue that that's what generally happens, is that there are mm -hmm. um, problems that emerge within um, a system and uh, that, that the solution that is found is, is one that resolves the bottleneck or resolves the problem. I mean, the, the, the um, you know, I prefer, I'm afraid I prefer to talk about examples that I know uh, really well and can document really well. And so the example that I gave of the emergence of pottery at Chattelhuic is an example where, where the bottleneck was that um, for a whole series of reasons, um, the house, uh, um, was becoming the locus of a large number of different types of activity. Uh, and so that people were um, producing, um, making artifacts, cook, cooking and processing uh, food, uh, carrying out rituals, burying people. I mean, there was a huge amount of stuff that was going on in the very narrow space of the, of the house. And, and one of the pressures that you see through time is the gradual increase in the size of the house as, as more and more um, activities are brought in. And that's a general process that happens throughout the Neolithic of the, Neolithic of the Middle East. And so what I argue is that as, as more and more is happening in the house, uh, that you need to have a more efficient method of cooking and that people had been cooking with clay balls, which is as you heat the balls and then you cook things on, on the heated balls. Um, but it's a very it's a very efficient process in one way, but it's very time consuming in the other. And so, in order to create time to carry out all the other activities going on in the house, the idea was to introduce cooking pottery, which um, which is uh, acts as a delegate of humans. So it sort of sits on the hearth and cooks, if you like, on its own. Um, and so it releases the cook to do more different types of things. And so I, I, I'm trying to argue that pottery. In cooking pottery uh, emerges as a pro as a solution to a bottleneck that is occurring uh, within houses at Chatelhuy through time, 
And yeah, and I would I've argued there are many other examples like this. Joanna Lee has a really interesting question about, um, well, about the beliefs that might lead towards disentangling. So she talks about being a vegetarian or a vegan, which might disentangle you from particular kinds of foods and the production systems involved in them. So there's a whole series of ramifications that get cut off if you're not eating animals. Uh, and she also mentions uh, particular belief systems like Buddhism and Taoism, which might also lead you towards uh, a simpler way of life and some, some forms of, of disentanglement. Um, is it the case that this is something that might lead people away from entanglement? I mean, is that a way that maybe people are going to go in the future, that it, it becomes um, not so much individual choice as involvement in larger belief systems that, that leads away from uh, what might be now seen as calamitous in, uh, entanglements. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, but absolutely. And um, I think that's incredibly important uh, that, that clearly there are ascetic or um, spiritual um, movements across the globe that, that, uh, that would take, would, would draw us back from some some of the in, you know very negative um, entrapments that we've got caught up in, and I I um I I, I mean it's, uh, you know, it's difficult to see in the future, but but cer certainly I would hope that that it would be the impetus from those sorts of sources, you know, whether it's Buddhism or what, whatever it is, those sorts of sources that that, that will lead us in a different direction, and you know, and veganism and vegetarianism are are. are Good examples of that. I mean, one of one of one of the major contributions to global warming is cattle and cattle farming, both because of the products from cattle and because of the and because of deforestation. And and if we were to stop eating, you know, beef, uh, that 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 would um, you know be a major contribution. But but I I um, I have a sort of yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated by the notion that what that what is fundamentally needed is is a change in our orientation with the world, and I don't see that happening unless it's through some sort of spiritual engagement with the world in, in some way. Uh, there's another interesting question from Marushka Svatik, who's talking about. Um, earlier on, you were talking about object agency, uh, different ways of thinking about materiality and the new materialisms. And she's asking whether you could say something about issues about, say, climate, climate change and environmental change, and how those notions of material things being active uh, are connected with those kinds of, of, of issues and processes. So the question is, what is the relationship between the new materialisms and climate change? Well, I suppose it's more how um, ideas of active material culture and object agency might affect the way that we think about issues of climate change, uh, environmental issues, and so on. Yeah. Um, I. You know, my, 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 my concern about the new materialisms and the, why I'm critical of them, even though I, I, I guess my work is part of them, is, is that I, um, I, I feel that once one has talked about the notion of, you know, heterogeneous assemblages of things, you know, that, that, that's really about as far as one gets and, and it's not, and there's no real dynamism to it. And, um, and so for me, uh, entanglement is different because it has this notion of, um, of, uh, of, of, sort of, of a dialectical dependence between humans and things, that, that, that pushes things forward. So, it, so in other words, that there is a fundamental asymmetry in our relationship with things. And whereas m many of the new materialisms have a sort of flat ontology, and I, and I don't, I, I, I worry about that for, for a whole series of, 
of reasons. Um, so um, in, in that sense, I, I, I think, I, I don't feel myself, and I, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't feel myself that um, new materialisms really contribute very much to the sort of issues that I'm talking about, largely because they, they lack a political, political component. Yes, I, I think that issue of uh, a flat ontology is one that is, is I don't know, I think it, it's, it's a bit complicated and it's, it, it can take you in a number of different ways. I think recognising that humans are one kind of thing amongst others and that everything is very, very complicated and the world is not simply divided up into humans and, and other things is fine. But I think there is a version, which I think you alluded to, to earlier, where everything is the same as everything else and it becomes completely flat and featureless and, and I, I agree with you I think that's that's really quite problematic yeah but I think another way of, 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 uh, of putting it would be in the arguments that you're constructing about a process of evolution um, a process of greater entrapment and so on I wonder what they'd look like if you put the people the, the, the things at the centre rather than the people. What, what does entanglement look like from the point of view of the objects? Yeah, but I, I mean, before I go down that, that road, I, I, I want to say that I I'm very much resist the decentering. Of, of the human mm. and you know that that's um you know we live in a world in which the major concerns are to do with things to do with black lives matter or um it, it, it gross inequalities and um uh my, you know migration and movements of people uh, uh, uh you know we live in a world of extreme um inequality and hardship for, for many. And uh, I, I think we need uh, approaches that contribute to an understanding of the way we treat each other and of the um, inequalities that we, we have created. So, so I, I, sorry about sort of banging that drum, drum but, 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 I, but I just think it's extremely, so I'm very, very much against uh, any sort of decentering. Um, however, um, clearly one, one can ask the question, what, 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 what does it look like from the point of view of a pot, you know, Chattanooga, <laughs> to, to talk about entanglements? And, 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 you know, a big part of entanglement is not the human thing relationship, it's the thing thing relationship. And, uh, you know, we, we were talking earlier, you were asking earlier about this invisibility. We don't see the, all the uh, connections. And you know, you know, I'm sitting at my laptop, and I don't, I don't notice really the fact that it's plugged into the wall. You know, it, it sure. and there is a whole, there are these huge, great machines out there producing electricity that comes. So, so um, with, with the with the pottery at uh, Chattelhuyu, from the point of view of the the clay, if you like, or the, <laughs> makes the pot. What, what, what entanglement in, involves is a sort of massively increased amount of connections with things. And um, uh, the, the thing that things are becoming dependent on other things. Um, and that the translations of things through different media and so on are becoming much more complex and uh, frequent. Um, so that the so that the milk that used to go from the from the the, the sheep uh, in, into the human now goes into a pot and gets changed into cheese, which gets changed into so on and so on and so forth. You know, there, there are lots of processes that are going on um, that basically mean that from the pot's point of view. Uh, it becomes less and less able to act on its own. I mean, it, it becomes it becomes entirely entangled with many many other things, uh, which it's out of control of. So this, this is you know 
maybe that's a helpful way of thinking about entanglement is that the pot can no longer function without humans to create all these connections to it. So which is, you know, which is the entrapment. Well, I'm just looking at the remaining questions. Oh, right. One from Greg Bailey. Thanks as ever for a most enlightening talk. Uh, I'm trying to make sense of this, sorry. What, oh, sorry, what you explain of material and human entanglement, of course, makes absolute sense. Could you say something about ideological or symbolic action and relationships? Do plastered skulls and wall paintings emerge from increasingly complex functionality? Yeah, I, 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 I could talk at great length about, you know, whether we become entangled in ideas and what, what, what is the role of ideas. I mean, part, part of my answer is that I, I don't think it's possible to talk about the immaterial or ideas or symbols without things. I mean, I think um, the material and the ideal uh, are always entirely um, linked up to each other. So that, um, you know, some of the biggest things we produce nowadays uh, are the product of ideas. You know, the Hadron Collider is, is in search of, you know, search of theories about subatomic particles or, or cathedrals and mosques and temples and so on are the product of ideas um, uh, about religion. And, and um, at Chadal Huyuk, I think it's the same, that there are, there are ideas that develop which are entirely material, or very much they're linked to the material that are about you know, passing down ancestral bones and about um, uh, teasing and killing wild animals and putting their their artifacts in in the houses and so on and so forth. That they, these these are all different forms of entanglement that that have uh, an origin uh, in a, a, set, a set of ideas of, of, of various sorts. So so I, I I don't think it's impossible. I don't I, clearly one also gets entangled in the ideas themselves. But what I'm really talking about is the way that ideas are always uh, embedded in things. And it's, those, it's that relationship which creates the sort of entanglements that I'm talking about. Uh, I see that David Chankton has got a hand up. Uh, I think he'd probably like to ask a, a question verbally. So David, do go ahead. Well, good afternoon. That was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. I, I, um, it's, uh, of course, a, one, a wonderful book. Um, I, I've actually got lots of questions, but um, why don't I, I, I just ask a couple at the beginning? Um, well, perhaps I might, I might ask three, but um, uh, the, the first one is, um, are you, is your overall message one that we can understand as a, a, a metaphor for other modernization theories or a contribution to them? Was I asked that because of course, most modernization theory uh, centers around the final um, few hundred years really thinking about the emergence of the Industrial Revolution and the astonishing changes which you refer to repeatedly throughout. Um, but those, in, those later modernization theories also, of course, often thought, talk about the intellectual reorganization of human thought that has allowed the massive expansion and so on. So you do refer to that quite a lot indirectly, but you also seem to imply that it's a much longer durée. And I think you hinted at that as well in your, in your um, early presentation. So um, that, that kind of makes me wonder whether what you're suggesting is in effect a replacement for all that later modernization theory which concentrates on, for example, the emergence of rationality or something like that. Um, so that's the first question. Uh, the, the, the second can, one- Can, can, can we do them one at a time, David? Hmm. Pardon? Can we do one them one at a time? Absolutely, sorry, there was like, go, go ahead, please, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, I am, um, yes, that's right. I mean, I, I um, because I'm a prehistorian and, and because for me, like as for Julian, the, the real important revolution is the Neolithic revolution. Um, I, I certainly do take a long-term view. And, and uh, it seems to me, I, I would argue that, that the 18th, 19th centuries or whatever, wherever, wherever one wants to put it, um, the enlightenment period and onwards, um, 
that that that, that is simply a, a speci- in terms of the entanglement that I'm talking about is is just a specific um, example of something that go- has gone on for a much much longer period of time, and that the the sort of process that I'm talking about began when humans first uh, when humans first started making tools, and that that that, that and from then on there is just this sort of gradual gradual process with its ups and downs and bumps and so on, a, a gradual process of increasing entanglement. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, the break that is caused, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, the spiritual relationships with the world, the break that occurs with, you know, the, the emergence of rational thought and objectification and separation of the mind and matter and so on, that, that, that that's an extremely important uh, event that has all sorts of implications. But I, but I would see, as I said, as, as part, part of this longer term process. I, 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 it annoys me, I'm afraid, that you, you, you very, very often in talking about modern problems, one, one sees them as starting from that, that period rather than have, taking a longer term view. Mm. I mean, that, that's for me really fascinating because it sort of brings me into something I've also been thinking about, which are the implications of your writing in this general way for those of those of our, well, those people we might advise who say to us, should they become archaeologists? It seems to me in part, you're redefining the role of archaeology. Um, I don't know whether you think you are, but, you know, by saying, well, in fact, <laughs> by implication, that we, should, we shouldn't bother too much about the past in many ways. You know, so therefore, what role should we tell people remains for the archaeologists? Because it presumably can't only be to help people solve an identification because that just leads to a kind of an, an endless regress where you simply get ever multiplying groups or redefining themselves through, media, through material culture. And then where's the role of the academic in that? Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I, I teach, I, teach um, I should say uh, in your introduction, Julian, you said I was a professor at Stanford, and I wasn't until very recently, I'm now emeritus, so I just wanted to make, make, make that point. But I, I, have, I have for some years taught a course at, at Stanford called Digging for Answers, and that takes uh, five uh, questions of our big questions of our time. The, the idea is to choose five big questions, you know, and, and they are things like sort of cl- climate change uh, and, and, and inequality and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and and consumerism and I can't, I can't can't remember the others anyway five big questions of our time and and it, and it argues that um, you know you get a different perspective on those questions um, another one is violence you know increasing violence if you, if you if you you take a different you get a different set of answers if you look at the period of the last two hundred years and if you look at the last twenty thousand years. You know, it gives a different perspective and you get different answers about what is the cause of violence and what is the cause of inequality. And so, so I, do, I, I, do, I do feel that archaeologists should be trying to um, address these big questions from the long term. It's, it's worth saying that that is something that has been something that archaeologists have tried to do for a long time. Because Gordon Child uh, yeah. imagined himself to be writing really the very beginnings of, of the history of capitalism. And he, he said yeah. that, you know, the long term trajectory that led towards capitalism started in the Bronze Age. But um, you know, it's, it's rather sad that between then and now, um, few have attempted it. Yeah, no, that's right, Julian. And I, and I, you know, Child really stands out, and there have been some other figures. But on the whole, I, I think archaeologists have not been very effective at, at really addressing them. And we tend to get very absorbed in, in um, fascinating questions uh, that, that are quite narrow. David, did you have further questions? Well, to, I could have lots of, but I just wanted to make one small point, which is not that I would wish to disagree with anything that Ian said about the um, poverty traps, because they obviously are there. But you know, of course, one of the reasons um, that it's so difficult to give up on all this sort of thing uh, is because in many parts of the world, for many people in really very large numbers, escape from poverty is possible. 
Um, and they, of course, they get that escape largely by moving and transitioning into what, broadly speaking, the sociologists still call the middle class. You know, they get themselves a house with a roof and heating if necessary and all the normal impediments. And that does actually happen in a very quick rate. I mean, uh, you can trace it happening in, in Turkey, of course, where you've worked for so many years. The expansion of people moving from poverty to a reasonable standard of life is fantastically quick still. I and mean, it's happening to millions of people here over a period of every few years. I mean, India, it's happening also incredibly quickly. Um, and of course, historically, it happened to Japan also in the space of only about two generations. So I'm certainly not wishing to, to, to say that there's anything wrong in the book, but I'm just saying that, 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 that in fact, the escape from poverty trap, because it can actually quite often be successful, it acts perhaps as a, as, as a kind of a chimeric goal that people are still trying to reach. And some of them do in fact make it. Yeah, no, and, and clearly, you know, I, I am the context that I'm writing for is the United States, where the, the idea that you can make it and that some people make it is mm -hmm. reinforced by endless examples that people help hold up. But statistically, you know, the amount of upward mobility in the United States is, is much lower than most European countries. And, uh, and, and I, and, and I'm, very attuned or I'm very aware of the fact that people who desperately want to get out of the poverty trap can't do it. You know, um, and so whether you can or cannot get out of the poverty trap obviously depends on many, many factors. And I'm not arguing at all that there are cases where it's not possible. But, but in, in certain situations, one really need, does need to talk about a poverty trap, I think. Oh, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I quite agree. Um, well, well, thank you very much, Julian. I have, I've, I've um, enjoyed myself asking these questions. Uh, allow me to put my hand down. I'm sure there are other people who would like to as well. So the hand goes down. Thank you so much. Good. I think we've got time for just another couple of questions. One is from Petra Black, who is asking you to say a bit more about uh, entanglement and the ephemeral qualities of things. So, for instance, she says, the way in which things can become something else. Uh, the way in which they can become waste and so on. Yes, that things become waste. But that... Um, so so arche archaeologists talk about you know, behavioural chains or chain of Rishwar and various or life histories, and, and certainly things become waste. Um, but that doesn't mean that they, we become less entangled with them. I mean, what, what do you do about waste? And uh, <clears throat> I go jogging uh, in, in the Bay Area in a beautiful parkland that is um, that was originally, I, in fact, I saw it, it was, it was a huge, great trash uh, dump and um, uh, over many acres and absolutely foul uh, and, and the amount of energy that's gone into the amount of resources that has gone into transforming that landscape into a, a pleasant parkland is, is mind-boggling and you would have thought that okay well once once you've done it you've done it and then, you know, then, then you can carry on running and it's okay but in fact it isn't okay because the, the stuff keeps bubbling up and the, 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 there's um, foul stenches that keep getting produced and a huge amount of effort into landscaping and managing all this stuff that's under the ground. So it's a continual, continual long-term, I mean, very, very long-term entanglement with huge amounts of resources having to go into that. So things may seem ephemeral, <coughs> but they often aren't. I mean, they, they often disappear from view, but they disappear from view because someone is making them disappear. You know, so there's a huge amount of effort going into, into um, making them disappear. But I guess the question that follows on from that is, if things are <coughs> changing and they change in fundamental ways, does that not mean that their entanglements change? Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, are we talking about something like refuse? I, I think refuse is, is an example of that, but I think there are other ways in which you could say that, that things, things have life histories, um, the meanings of things change, 
uh, and that you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they become unentangled, but it may mean that the overall configuration of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, definitely. I mean, I, I um, more recently, I've, I've tried to stop talking about things as such and talk, talking more about the flows of things. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things are always, we, we try to, we see things as solids. We, we tend to sort of think of the world in terms of solids. I think Bergson said that. And I think it's extremely important that we think of things in terms of solids when they're not actually solids. They're always changing, not, not necessarily you know, the pen changing, but, but the context around it so so therefore its entanglements are changing and um and uh and, and so that's part of entanglement you know, that, 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 it, that they're all that all these things are, all these flows are going around together and intersecting and 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 sort of transforming so that, that there isn't you said earlier i think julian there's this notion of stability with things and and i guess my focus is is much more on the fact that nothing is stable that everything Everything is always changing. Everything turns to dust, uh, and um, yeah, that's rather like the way that Tim Ingold talks about materials flowing into and out of artifacts. So that you know that the artifact is only a temporary state of affairs, and everything is eventually going to follow the laws of thermodynamics and go off and become something else. Yes, that's right. But uh, but I'm talking slightly. I mean, I think that's true. But but it's also the case that this pen you know is you know it's more like in a gel sense that, that this is part of a history of pens and and you could draw battleship curves that go around this thing you know and and it, this is the shape of it is not not because it's not just because it's functional but because the previous fair pen was a you know was a so it, this is has a legacy from all these other pens that come through it and and so it, it's just just a, a part of a flow that we don't see the flow but it's there and, and um, so think this is reacting to things before it and after it. You know, it's it's um, so there's yeah. a kind of a historical flow and a material flow. For yes, exactly. So there's two types, two types of flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I've got one more question, which is it's maybe a bit off topic, but it is very interesting. Um, Emily Hayes is asking about your and um, how you, the outcomes of your work have flowed into Turkish educational contexts and textbooks. Um, that does seem to be something very interesting to hear about. Yes, no, that is very interesting and um, um, raises a whole series of issues that I would uh, love to talk about um, and work on. Uh, so I, I had to, I've just retired from Stanford and I'm going and I've started uh, teaching at Koch University, which is a university in Istanbul, which is where I will be based. Uh, and, and so I'll be able to answer your question more fully when, when I've um, done more teaching at Koch and, and talk to the students and so on. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the question is very, very complex uh, because, you know, Turkey um, is a society with many different groups of people in it. Um, and with different sets of interests and different relationships with the past. And um, while, while for some, Chattel Hyuk has had a clear uh, impact for others, um, because of our association with uh, Western intervention, um, for, for others, what we have done has been, um, has had less of an impact. You know, we, we, we did a lot of work in educational books for schools and we had a big educational programs. Um, some, some, we, we, but we've also done a lot of evaluations of those programs and some of them have been extremely disappointing. Uh, our community outreach stuff has been extremely disappointing. Very successful from our point of view in the sense that we engaged communities and did a lot of educational stuff. But if you look at the impact, it's very minimal. And, and that's one of the reasons for that is, um, you know, a rejection of some of the values that we propose or are associated with. And so it's difficult. And um, uh, I, you know, I have written about it and I will write more about it. But, um, you know, it, it is a colonial, it, one has to accept that it was 
a colonial enterprise in, to some degree, however much one tried for it not to be. Uh, and, um, you know, I've learned a lot in that process uh, about how difficult it is to be, to decolonize. I, I'm, I'm, you know, the, 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 the movement in archeology span at the moment to decolonize <clears throat> is in my view, um, raising issues that are, that are not as easy as some people seem to think in terms of dealing with. Um, and, I, and I worry that archeology span is fundamentally colonizing and uh, I'm not sure that it's possible to decolonize. <clears throat> but um, I mean, I think we should try and, uh, and I did try at Chatop, but, but I think it's difficult. And, uh, and the, so the question you raise is a very, very timely one and one that I worry about and I'm, and I'm trying to work on. Does archeology span then become something different if it decolonizes? become so fundamentally different that it's no longer archaeology. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've got time for one very last question, which is from Matthew O'Leary, who's asking about you about your own role as an archaeologist in the flow of things. In other words, uh, a Neolithic tool is discarded and becomes part of the archaeological record and is then excavated. Um, what is your own role, role then in the flow of things in that, that kind of a process? Yes, that's that's a nice question. I, I um I I felt at Chatelhuyo very entangled. You know, I I um by the past and by the present, and uh, um I felt very much the decisions that we made early on had a lot of impact later later on. You know, one, one in a very simple, obvious example is that when one digs in, at a big tell site, one has to throw the earth somewhere. So you know, have spoil tips. But once you put the spoil tip somewhere, you can't really dig underneath it. So, so you, you know, you, you've, and, and another example is once you start digging in a big tell site, um, you're really, on a path dependent process because you know you start at the top and you, and you have to go down and down and down for health and safety reasons so you end you end up with a very in a very small bit at the bottom and um and you can't really go back you can't ch change that uh because you've invested so much in the open in the clearing of the top so there are a lot whole sorts of ways and that i felt very much part of a path dependent entangled process and uh, you're asking about the artifacts that we, you know, that we excavated. Uh, again, I felt very, very much that I was part of the flow in the, in the sense that I could make decisions, but they were very constrained by Turkish law and, um, and by local museums and by local interest groups of various sorts. So that while I could contribute to the flow, of the of the, the artifacts through the you know through the process I, I had very little say in really how that worked out and so you know one in clear example is that i would have loved to have put many artifacts on display but for a whole series of political reasons uh, most of those artifacts are now in um in storage uh cases and um the, it needs a new politics for that stuff to be brought out and put on display so So I'm part of the process, we made decisions, but they all were very constrained and they were all very path dependent. I said that uh, we finished with the questions, but every time I say that, another one pops up. So I'm <laughs> going to have just one more to, to round off with. It's from Victoria Brandon, who's saying, as we become more aware of our entanglements and of the environmental damage that they cause, can we influence their direction? Can we influence the temporal flow? Uh, or does the entanglement have a kind of a, a chaotic mind of its own that resists us? Yes, I, th I, 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 I think that latter is true, that, we, that there is a sort of um, um, 
juggernaut aspect to it, you know, that, that, it that there's so much entangled together that it's very difficult to pick it apart and do much with it. Um, it, 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 it seems like it has a mind of its own, but of course it doesn't. Uh, in, in the, you know, we, we can do something about it. We can, we can intervene, um, although that's very, very difficult. I mean, it, it's very, in, in the climate debates, I, I'm very struck at how most of the discussion is really about how we reduce carbon emissions and so on. Um, you know, how, how do we clean up carbon emissions, for, for example, rather than looking at why we're, why we're producing emissions, in, in which you know, I'm arguing is a lot, a lot of it is to do with um, our, our investment in consumption and in new technologies and so on. So, so rather than saying, you know, we should stop using iPhones or stop buying new cars or, 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 or so, we, we say somehow we stop the emissions. And so I worry that we, we're not really dealing with the fundamental question. Um, we're, we're rather dealing with the symptoms rather than with the cause. I mean, obviously, that's a gross, gross generalization. And there are many, many movements who are doing what, what I'm arguing we should be doing. But nevertheless, it, a lot of the debate seems slightly off kilter to me. And um, so that's one of the ways in which I, I think it, it is very difficult to um, redirect the juggernaut. Is that, you know, we're not we're often not really seeing what are the real causes. I think that's a, a really good question to end with. <laughs> so I'd like to first of all, thank the audience very much for their attention, for being here and their questions. And then I'd like to ask, uh, um, thank Ian, greatly for answering all those questions and for being so uh, so helpful in, in presenting this work and uh, telling us so much more about it. So I'm now going to hand back over to Habim. Thank you so much. I'm going to just be short and say thank you, Ian, and thank you, Tom, uh, Julian. Uh, it was really a wonderful, interesting conversation you had, and I think our audience thought the same because of all the questions that came in. So thank you for everybody to coming to our event, staying along till the very end, for those of you who are still there. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful uh, evening and also a good day to you, Ian. I know it's in the Thank morning. you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so thank, much. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Julian, and thank you to all the questions. Really great. Thank you.